So it's good to be with you guys today. As always, I'm really thankful uh, to be part of this church family. I feel like I say that every time I come in here, but I, I mean it every time that I say it. And so I just keep saying it over and over. Tonight, we have a great opportunity to spend some time together. And uh, even if it rains, we're going to have hot dogs indoors or or something like that. There's going to be fun to be had. And so uh, don't extend your nap just because uh, it's raining outside. Go ahead and come uh, out for the backyard bash this afternoon. So if you are a guest with us, we're thankful that you are here with us. We are at the end of our series through First Peter. We've got two sermons left. We're starting chapter five today. And so uh, if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to go ahead and grab your Bible, open it up to uh, First <clears throat> Peter chapter five. The churches that Peter is writing to are people that are exiles. They feel like outsiders. They feel like strangers in the world that they live in. They're trying to be faithful to the Lord despite being different from this world that they're living in. They're trying to be on mission despite being rejected by the people that are around them. To continue to be faithful is hard, and history tells us that it's about to get harder. Peter began his letter writing to these followers, reminding them that Jesus had formed them into churches and that they are unique because of the work of Jesus, his redemptive work within them. And then he challenges them because of this unique work that Jesus has done in your heart. He wants us to live a unique lifestyle, a lifestyle that reflects Jesus to the world outside so that we might not be accepted by everyone, but we will win some because of the testimony that comes through us by the work of Jesus in us. And ultimately, though, Peter tells us that as followers of Jesus, we will be rejected and we will suffer. And as we do that, we will do that because we are following in the footsteps of our Savior. We are our followers of Jesus after all. Last week, as Peter began to close the letter, we talked about how it felt like he had taken a break in chapter 4, verse 11. It's like he had written everything that he wanted to say, and then he kind of stands up, and maybe he goes on a walk, and he clears his mind, and he comes back, and he says, these are the main things that if they snoozed at any part during that, uh, those first four chapters, that what do they need to hear now before We go ahead and close up this book, and here's what Peter wanted them to know. He wanted them to know that they were going to suffer, and he gave a summary of how they were supposed to suffer, of what suffering would look like and how suffering would bring glory to the Lord. Throughout this series, we've heard Peter's voice as he talks to these people. They're not just uh, people, an audience that's out receiving his Uh, letters that are unknown. No, they are people that Peter knows and people that Peter loves. He writes to them as a pastor. In the final words of this letter, Peter has a few things he doesn't want them to miss. That lesson on suffering we heard last week. And he wants us to know as we conclude this book that our greatest resource to persevere in our faith, our greatest resource other than the Holy Spirit, other than God's Word, is the church. It's the people sitting in this room, the people who gathered in this room before you, the people gathering down the hill. Our greatest resource is our ability to persevere on mission for the Lord is this body of faith, this family of believers that we have joined ourselves to. The church is important. Peter wants you to hear that today. We accomplish the mission of God together not as lone rangers, but as through the church. Knowing the tension these followers of Jesus felt as they were on mission, the suffering that they would endure for living out their faith, Peter closes his letter by encouraging them to look to the right, look to the left, to look in front of them, to look behind them, to look at the people that they were on mission with together and to understand what the church was, that they were on mission together. This means the means by which we are to make Christ known among all people, the means by which we are to disciple people, the means that we empower people to mission is the church. 
This week and next week, we'll hear Peter's closing words about the church. He has two primary audiences. The first audience you'll hear about today, he gives a final word concerning pastors. And then next week, you'll hear he has a final word concerning church members. My prayer for this week and for next week is that we will hear these words, not as exhortations of a pastor who's writing to a people a long time ago in a faraway place, but that we would hear it afresh today as a church, the church of Brainerd Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, July 31st, 2022. Brainerd Baptist Church, a church in a cultural context very similar to the one that Peter's audience is in. Brainerd Baptist Church, walking through a time of pastoral transition. As we walk through these times, as we live and try to do church together, be on mission together, I pray that we will hear Peter's heart for us today. Not for churches that are in that faraway place, but what does Peter, what does the Holy Spirit through Peter have to say to us about how we are supposed to be a church family together? I pray we hear Peter's exhortation to Brainerd Baptist Church through the letter written to these churches. And here is Peter's message for us this week. Brainerd needs their pastors to follow Christ's example as they lead God's church faithfully until Jesus' return. I'm going to say that again. Brainerd needs their pastors, needs her pastors to follow Christ's example as they lead God's church faithfully until his return. Our passage today is focused on pastors, folks like me. I can tell you the day that as I've studied this passage, I've been beaten up all week, pleading with the Lord, Lord, would you please let me be this kind of pastor? I want to be the kind of pastor that this letter is talking about. I want to serve our church well. The other pastors that we have at Brainerd, they want to serve you well. They want to embody what this is. And throughout this week, I've also prayed for our next senior pastor that he will embody what this passage says. Today, for those of you who aren't pastors, which is the majority of you, you could read this passage and you could use it as an evaluation tool. You could look at folks like me and our other pastors and you could be like, oh, they're doing a good job doing this or a bad job doing that. You could judge how we're doing, and there's a place for that. We're to be held accountable by you for those pieces, by, by, by passages like this one. But I believe that Peter includes this message at this spot in this letter to remind the church that this is what they need. Our family of faith needs pastors like this, maybe particularly in the context of suffering. You see, one of the nutrients that every body of Christ needs is a pastor who follows Christ's example as they lead God's church faithfully until his return. You see, just like a marriage, a husband and wife, they have complementing roles. The husband needs to focus on what his role is. The wife needs to focus on what her role is. But it's really important and helpful if they know what each other's role is. Our church is made up of pastors and members. They complement one another. We each need to focus on what our role is in this relationship, but it's also helpful for us to understand what you need to expect of me and what I need to expect of you, how we work together to fulfill God's mission among us. And so with that in mind, let's look at our passage today and observe what the role of the pastor should look like. 1 Peter chapter 5 Verses 1 through 4. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money but eagerly, Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. 
Now allow me to eliminate one issue immediately. This is a preemptive strike for those of you who hear that word elder and it causes stress in you. The words elder, pastor, and overseer in the New Testament are always used synonymously. In our modern context, using these words, the word elder, it may imply some specific type of church government or polity, but in the Bible, these words all mean the same thing. So anytime that you see elder, if that causes the hair on the back of your neck to stand up, just pretend it says pastor. If that causes you to stress, pretend it says overseer. I can't give you uh, any other words. Those three are the only ones. So I, go with those three. Any, whatever causes you stress, go with the others. They're synonyms. A modern-day dynamic translation of verse number one, if Peter were here and he were writing to the church, might be pastors. If you're in the room, I've been giving you four chapters of things that you need to know about this, but this is specifically for you, pastors. Listen up. This is for you. Let me challenge you to do this. Now, as Peter begins, he doesn't want to come off as arrogant He demonstrates his humility as he begins to speak to these fellow pastors. He is Peter, but he doesn't act like that. He says, I'm like you. I'm a pastor too. I'm a fellow elder. Peter isn't writing to these elders, these pastors, as someone who is over them. He's not their supervisors. He's not the great apostle. He's writing to them as a peer. He's writing to them as a fellow pastor, a pastor who knows what it means to care for a church, to lead a church. Peter has reflected the heart of a pastor throughout this book. He has said over and over things like, dear friends, beloved, loved ones. Peter's not writing as a superior. He's not writing as a celebrity. He's not writing as as some type of personality. He is writing to these churches as a pastor. He loves these churches. He cares for these churches. Peter also says that he is, he's a fellow witness of the sufferings of Christ. Now, that should surprise you a little bit because from all that we know about Peter, what did he do? At the time that Jesus was being, was being on trial, what did Peter do? He denied Jesus and he went away in shame. He didn't see the death of Jesus. So, what does he mean here? When he's talking about the sufferings of Christ, these people that Peter is writing to, they most likely weren't there for Christ's crucifixion either. Well, I think that Peter is talking about what he's just finished in the previous verses, verses that we saw last week. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13, instead, Peter writes, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ. Peter would have seen Jesus rejected in his ministry. He saw the crowds turn away when hard ministry came. He came and he saw when the rich young ruler came and Jesus said, give me your all. And the rich young ruler turned and went in the opposite direction. He saw Jesus be rejected. He would have seen Jesus' suffering in ministry. But Peter would have also experienced that suffering. As he writes to these letters, he writes these, these churches, he writes to them from the city of Rome where he's also going through suffering, where he's also in a context of, of tension and how he's not being accepted by the people around them. He understands. He's seen the suffering of Christ, the suffering, how other people have suffered for Christ, those who shared in the sufferings of Christ. Peter was a witness Peter was a partaker of the sufferings of his Savior. And that also explains the next statement, a statement that talks about Peter's hope. Do you see it in the passage? A hope that he shared with those that he is writing to. One, he writes, one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13 that we just referenced gives clarity as to what Peter's talking about here. He's talking about suffering. He's talking about sharing in the suffering of Christ. Rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ. Anytime that we suffer for the sake of Jesus, we suffer along with Christ. We share in his sufferings. And then Peter says, so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. Just like the pastors and the members of the churches that Peter is writing to, Peter shares in Christ's sufferings and shares in the promise of Christ's coming glory. There's a bad side to following Jesus. We share in his suffering, but there is a good side of following Jesus in that we will also share in the glory to come. 
Peter's just like these people that he's writing to. He's living just like them. He's pastoring just like these pastors. He's suffering just like they're suffering. He's looking forward to an eternal reward just like they are. And so what does Peter say to these pastors? He has associated himself with them. He has came in close. He's leaning in. He says, pastors, listen to this. He says to them, shepherd God's flock among you. One sentence. Pastors, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to shepherd God's flock among you. The role of the pastor is to shepherd. My job, the job of pastors at Brainerd Baptist Church is to shepherd God's flock among us. Paul wrote letters to Timothy and Titus, probably ones that you're more familiar with about the roles and the characteristics, the qualifications of pastors. He gives instructions, Paul does, to to Timothy and Titus, talking to them about church governance and how they're supposed to practice and do church together. But Peter, writing to these churches, maybe because they're in a time of suffering and tension, or maybe because this letter isn't addressed just to pastors, but to churches in general, Peter gives them a distilled definition of what it means to be a pastor. A pastor is a shepherd. A pastor is a shepherd. The church consists of shepherds. The church consists of sheep. The shepherd and the sheep complement one another. The role of the shepherd is to lead and care for the sheep. The role of the sheep is to follow and trust the shepherd. You see, a shepherd without sheep is just a guy in the field with a stick. Sheep without a shepherd are wandering and they're about to be a buffet. Now, as we consider this illustration of shepherds leading and sheep following shepherds, there are some of us who immediately want to reject that idea, that notion. There's some of us, we don't like to submit ourselves to anyone. We don't like anyone to be over us or to lead us, to tell us what to do in any way. That's a natural instinct for us not to want to follow. A pastor who wrote on this uh, commentary, his name is Juan Sanchez. He's a pastor in Texas. He describes this type of sheep, the type of sheep who doesn't want to have a shepherd. He says the only Christians who would not want this kind of leadership over them are proud ones who think they don't need anyone's help. And the sheep that go it alone tend not to last long, let alone thrive. That's what Sanchez says. Let me put what Sanchez just said into Kevinese, okay? You may want to write this down. Lone wolf sheep. Lone wolf sheep become lone wolf lunch. Okay, did you get that? That's an important one. Lone wolf sheep, if you're out on your own, do you know what happens to sheep who don't have a shepherd? They become a lone wolf's lunch. If the Lord has called you to be a sheep today, follow the shepherd that he has given to you. Allow me to quote Sanchez again. He goes on, as sheep who are prone to wonder, we need oversight. We need authoritative leadership. Sadly, though, Corruption, abuse, and incompetence give leadership a bad name both inside and outside of the church. In many ways, we are all suspicious of leadership, and nowhere are we more suspicious than in the church, where we should expect God's leaders to be above reproach. Sanchez affirms how hard it is to do this, to put ourselves underneath a shepherd. But then he adds, But we need to understand that the problem is not leadership over us. The problem is bad leadership. You see, the problem with putting ourselves under a leader, there's no problem in putting ourselves under the leadership of a shepherd unless the shepherd is a bad shepherd. The problem for husbands as they sacrifice for their wives, dying for her, the problem with wives submitting to her husband, the problem with slaves submitting to their master, the problems with anyone submitting to anyone is when the person that we're submitting to isn't good. They don't love the Lord. They're not walking in righteousness. They're not seeing themselves as a shepherd. 
If we trust that the shepherd will care for us, protect us, lead us, empower us, we want to put ourselves underneath that kind of shepherd. That's why Peter is writing here. He wants to inform both the sheep and the shepherds of the type of shepherd that the flock, that the shepherd needs. Probably all of us can think of times when leaders in the church have let us down. Some of those are personal. And other of those are more public. If you follow social media or Southern Baptist life, the one that immediately comes to my mind is the sexual abuse report that just come out, came out. There are other podcasts and documentaries that are going on right now about narcissistic pastors who have not obeyed God's command of shepherding God's flock among them. Our job as pastors is to shepherd the sheep of God, God's sheep among us. There's two important pieces to that statement that you can kind of glaze over and miss. The first one is that pastors are to shepherd whose flock? God's flock. That's an important piece. It's not the flock doesn't belong to the shepherd. The pastors are to shepherd God's flock. The members of Brainerd Baptist Church do not belong to the senior pastor or any other pastor. The members of Brainerd Baptist Church belong to the Lord. The pastors of Brainerd Baptist Church, we are the Lord's under-shepherds to Christ. We, We are under Him and we shepherd God's flock. Have you ever kept someone else's child? Have you ever babysitted some, babysat someone else's child? You see, with my children, I will allow them a certain amount of freedom. They can do things that I don't let other people's children do because I don't want them, those children taking the same risk as my children take. I don't want your children, the ones that you've entrusted me with, I don't want to break them and then give them back to you. I take special care of children when they're with me. Why do I do that? Because they are the most precious thing, possession that you have. I care for them differently because they don't belong to me. Shepherding God's flock should cause us to shepherd and care and always remember that what we are doing is we're not caring for something that we can take advantage of. We are caring for God's flock. Pastors, pastors shepherd God's flock. The sheep don't belong to the under-shepherd. And because of that, we pastors must take special care to shepherd our shepherd's sheep well. Here's the second piece that you could miss when you glaze over that statement. A pastor only shepherds God's flock among you. I'm not the pastor of God's sheep that are gathering today around the world. I'm not the pastor of his sheep gathering around the country or gathering around Chattanooga. I am only the pastor today of God's flock among Brainerd Baptist Church. I am one of your pastors today. If you are among the flock of Brainerd Baptist Church, the pastors of Brainerd Baptist Church are to shepherd God's flock among us well. That is our task. Our role as pastors is summarized in the act of shepherding. The way that we shepherd here at Brainerd is we deliver the word. We disciple the believer and we deploy the church to do what, we, what he has called us to do. We feed the sheep. We care for the sheep. We empower the sheep to go do what God's called us to do. If the primary role of the pastor is to shepherd, that should lead us to ask the question, what type of shepherds do we need? Well, Apparently, the churches that Peter was writing to were not so different than many of our churches today. They had lots of bad examples of shepherding. And so Peter immediately gives three negative examples to describe the type of shepherds that we don't need. Do you see those in the text? We don't need shepherds who lead out of compulsion. We don't need shepherds who are greedy for money. We don't need shepherds who lead, who lord over God's flock, the, the, who lord over God, the flock that God has entrusted them to. Here's what we do need. We need the opposite of that. We need shepherds with knowledge of God's word. We need shepherds with integrity. We need shepherds who reflect Christ-likeness. Let's look at the first characteristic of a shepherd. We need shepherds with knowledge of God's word. Verse, the second part of verse number two, shepherd God's flock among you, how? 
not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Shepherds give oversight to the sheep. We watch over. They care for them. They lead them. They protect them. They equip them. Shepherding in this way shouldn't be done by compulsion. Now, there's two ways that you can understand that word compulsion. The first one is out of obligation. Shepherds shouldn't serve because they have to serve. Shepherds should serve out of the blessing that it is that we get to serve. You see, it's a privilege to be called a shepherd. I wish that I could tell you today that it was always a joy to be a shepherd. But it's not. There's sometimes when sheep bite. There's sometimes when predators attack. There's sometimes when we lead sheep to fields that are supposed to be green and we get there and they are not green. Shepherding isn't always wonderful. It's not always a joy, but it is always a privilege that we get to care for the sheep that belong to the Lord, that He entrusts us to try to help you do what He's called you to do. What a privilege it is to steward and shepherd Christ's flock. The other way that we can understand the word compulsion, something that we shouldn't do, is lead by is lead impulsively. Compulsion, impulsive. Impulsive leadership isn't being a good shepherd or caring for God's flock well. It's leading out of our own desires and our own agendas. It's making decisions on a whim. We're not to lead out of compulsion. We shouldn't be impulsive leaders trying to do what we want rather than what God wants, leading and doing things by our agenda rather than God's agenda. Instead, we need, to sh- we need a shepherd who willingly leads as God would have him to lead. Pastors aren't serving out of obligation. They're serving willingly. And pastors aren't leading impulsively. They're leading according to God's word and God's will. Shepherding is more than giving an entertaining talk. It's rightly dividing the word as we teach and as we preach. It's also more than just preaching. It's leading our church according to God's word and what God's will for our church family is. Faithfully preaching the truth isn't all there is to being a shepherd. A shepherd must lead and care for the sheep according to God's will in order to shepherd well. That means that The shepherd's decision-making and leadership is determined by what God's Word says and what God's God's will is, not their own will or their own Word. We need shepherds with knowledge of God's Word. If you come to our church during the week, you'll oftentimes find our pastors talking about what it is that we're supposed to do and talk about this week arguing over minutia that you'll never hear about on a sermon, the text threads between Shaddix and Lasso and Baggett, and how we are arguing and trying to figure out how we best divide the Word so that you understand it and can apply it. We need shepherds who know God's Word. That is our desire for you today, our pastors. That's our desire. We also need shepherds with integrity It's the last part of verse number two. Shepherd God's flock among you, the main verb. Shepherd God's flock among you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly. What is the motivation for being a pastor, for being a shepherd? It certainly shouldn't be money. I'm thankful for how Brainerd Baptist Church cares for its pastors and for our families. I can't tell you how wonderful you are to treat us, how blessed we are to serve at this church. But if you are a pastor or you're pursuing being a pastor, if you're looking for a way to gain a fortune, there are better options than being a pastor or a preacher. I may have shared this with some of you before, but I I was a missionary in Argentina. I was involved in a number of uh, ordinations of pastors. One of the things that was always asked of a pastor was what their framework of accountability was in three areas. How will you hold yourself accountable financially to make sure that your finances are above reproach? How will you hold yourself accountable with the power that you have as you stand in a pulpit and make decisions? How will you hold yourself accountable accountable with relationships with the opposite sex. And we added another one at the end of our time. How will you hold yourself accountable with the prestige that comes with people knowing who you are, living in a, in a glass house? How a potential pastor responded to those questions 
what their framework for how they would hold themselves accountable would be was often what would determine whether a pastor would actually be ordained or not. And if they got through ordination and they were ordained with those questions as part of that process, they also knew that they would be held accountable to those questions going forward in ministry. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, you can't serve God in money. That's true. You can't serve God in anything else. You can only serve God and God. Shepherds must eagerly serve the Lord and nothing else. We need shepherds with integrity, men that are above reproach in all of these areas. Integrity and accountability are something that every shepherd should eagerly pursue, that we should charge after, that we should look for. We need to be men who love God's Word, who know God's Word. We need to be men of integrity. We also need shepherds who reflect Christ-likeness. Look at verse number 3. Peter says, shepherd God's flock among you, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. The way that we shepherd is to be a reflection of Jesus, to reflect how Jesus led. Jesus wasn't domineering. He wasn't a narcissist. He was humble. He put others before himself. He was self-sacrificing. He didn't wait for his feet to be washed. No, he took up the, the bin and the water and he washed the feet of those that he led. He modeled to his disciples what servant leadership was. He, we see servant leadership today every time that we open up the gospel and we see Jesus' life. But not only did Jesus serve by washing feet, but he also didn't play favorites. He loved and cared for all of his sheep. We saw that as he called and allowed the children to come to him, as the sick came to him. But we also saw it when he told about the pride of the religious leaders and the pride of the wealthy. You see, Jesus loved all the sheep, but he loved them all the same. He didn't defer to any or prefer any of them. He was a good shepherd to all the sheep. Today, we need shepherds who reflect Christ's likeness. We need shepherds with integrity. We need shepherds with knowledge of God's Word. Good shepherds do this willingly, eagerly, and humbly. Pastors shepherd God's flock in this way because because the reward of the shepherd is eternal. Look at verse number four. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive, receive the unfading crown of glory. Why do shepherds do what they do? They don't do it for the sheep, even though we love you. Why do shepherds do what they do? They do it for the chief shepherd, the shepherd who died on a cross for their sins, the shepherd who calls them to follow after them and model how he shepherded to others. Because the day will come when the under-shepherd will stand before the chief shepherd and give an account for how they shepherded his flock. Pastors will have to answer for what we did with the talents that the chief shepherd gave us. Do we take the responsibility that the Lord gives us and do we bury it or do we take those talents and multiply it? Will our pastors at Brainerd, will I be found to be faithful or will I be found to be unfaithful with the talents that the Lord has given me? The one who will decide that will be the chief shepherd. He will be the one who decides if I have been faithful or not. You see, my faithfulness, it won't be judged by wealth. It won't be judged by status. It won't be judged by comfort. It won't be judged by prestige. It won't be judged by titles in front of our name. It won't be judged by book sales. It won't be judged by downloads of sermons or podcasts. It won't be judged by the number of followers or likes that we receive on social media. Our faithfulness will be judged by the chief shepherd, by whether we obeyed his will, whether we walked in righteousness. All of those other things... All of those other things are fading crowns. But the crown for those faithful shepherds will be an unfading, unfading crowd. 
The Greeks were interesting. Uh, sometimes that they didn't have words to describe what they wanted to describe. Uh, apparently, uh, there were some of those people who liked landscape, uh, Greeks that liked landscaping like I do, and they liked flowers. Uh, I don't know about you, but one of the things that frustrates me the most about the flowers in my yard is they'll sometimes come up and look beautiful, and I'll get to enjoy them for about two or three days, and then they fall over dead, and they look ugly the whole rest of the time. Well, the Greeks, they were also like that, except for one flower, and that flower was called the amaranth. And the Greeks, as they talked about this as Peter wrote to these pastors about what this unfading, cl- unfading crown was. He actually used the word amaranth. There's probably some botanist in here who knows what an amaranth flower is, but for those that aren't botanists, let me tell you, it's this flower, you can eat it, but it has this strong, deep red color to it, and it holds that color forever. While all the other flowers pop up and look beautiful and die, that amaranth is, has this bold red beauty that lasts the entire time. It never fades. What Peter wanted to do was to paint a picture to these pastors, these shepherds, and say, if you are faithful, the, cl- the crown that you will receive will be like that amaranth flower. It will never fade. All of those other things that come up and look beautiful and go away That's not like the crown that you'll receive from me. The crown that you will receive will be that amaranth crown, the deep, wet red blossom that never fades. The reward for the faithful under-shepherd is an unfading crown of glory. Shepherds labor, sacrifice. They shepherd here for an eternal crown. Now, we've already said that pastors must shepherd with the right motives. And so, in case there's someone here thinking, Kevin's just doing what he's doing so he gets that unfading crown, I want you to understand what happens with that crown eventually. We don't shepherd in order to wear an eternal crown. Throughout Scripture, we see that every crown, every time that we talk about receiving a crown, it all has the same destination. Listen to Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, what will happen with those crowns of glory. The 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. Listen to what they do. They cast their crowns before the throne and they say, our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and by your will all things exist and were created. The final destination of the crown that those faithful shepherds have will be to lay that crown at the feet of our Savior. The blessing that we have for being faithful is that we get to tell our Savior it's one more praise song that we get to give to Him. Here is our final offering to you. All of our lives we give to you so that we can just say thank you one more time. That's the motivation for the faithful shepherd today, an eternal offering of gratitude to our Redeemer. Today, Brainerd needs their pastors. You need your pastors to follow Christ's example as we lead God's church faithfully until His return. Today, as we close, I want to uh, do something just a little bit different. If you came in here today and you don't know Jesus, uh, You've heard today about the value and how much Jesus loves you, so much so that he would call people to tell you about him, that he would call people to disciple you, that he would call people to go to the ends of the earth to deploy so that you would hear about his name. If you want to know that Jesus, you can know him so simply. You confess your sin and you commit to follow him as your Lord. There may also be someone that's sitting in this room and you hear all of this talk about pastoring and unbeknownst to everyone else here, you've been wrestling with the idea that God might be calling you to do something that you didn't even know that He could be calling you to do. There may be someone here that's wrestling with the fact that God could be calling you to be a pastor, to shepherd this way. If that's you, I would encourage you to right where you are today Commit yourself to the Lord and then tell someone. 
tell someone that you're wrestling with that feeling so that we can have that conversation together. But finally today, the part that we're going to do that's a little bit different is I want to encourage you today to pray for two things in particular. And um, today, as I mentioned, as all of you know, we are in a time of uh, transition with our pastors. We are praying and asking for the Lord to reveal to us who our senior pastor is. And I think our text today gives us the perfect opportunity to take just a moment and to pray for the man who's on the other side of this search. You see, a lot of our conversations that we have, I hear them, by the way, are about process and team and all of those things. Do you know the good news? We have a search team member, probably maybe more in here today. Do you know the good news? The Lord knows who our next pastor will be. Let's pray for that man today. Let's pray that the Lord would prepare him and give him a heart to shepherd us this way. Let's pray that the Lord would reveal him in his time. And let's pray that we would be sheep that are willing and happy to submit ourselves to that kind of shepherd. And after we pray that way, I would selfishly ask that you'd also pray for the other pastors of our church during this time of transition. I pray that, you would, that the Lord would give us a love for God's Word like we've never had. I pray that He would fill all of us with a desire to live, to seek accountability, to be men of integrity. And I also pray that the way that we do everything that He's called us to do would be done as a reflection of the, of the chief shepherd. And so today as we close, I'm going to uh, allow you to have just a moment to pray where you are. Maybe you want to put your arm around a wife or a friend or someone that you came with today. And I want you to take a moment, pray for the pastor who's on the other end, that God would reveal him in his time and that he would be this type of man. Pray for the pastors who are shepherding our church right now. And in just a moment, I'll, I'll close us in prayer and we'll sing our final worship song. in my life that cared about me enough to share the gospel with me over and over and over until one day came and I, uh, I submitted, Lord, to you and I found redemption in you and I found a Savior in you. I'm thankful, Lord, today that uh, we're not a pastorless church. I'm thankful, Lord, for all of the pastors, the staff who 
have served so faithfully at our church. And Lord, I pray that you would allow us, Lord, to be people who love your word, who know your word, who serve you, Lord, with integrity, who seek out accountability, Lord, and God, who reflect you to those in our church family so that they would want to be more like you. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of a transition, Lord, you know the pastor on the end of this search. I ask you, Lord, that today, wherever he is, that you would prepare his heart to be our pastor. Lord, I pray that you would build these things in him, that you would prepare him, that we would find him at the right time, not too soon and not too late, but at your time. I pray, Father, that we would be a people. We would be a flock, your flock of sheep, Lord, who are ready to follow him, that are ready to be led. And God, until that day comes and that pastor arrives, Lord, I ask you that we would be about your task, that we would be faithful, that all of us would live our lives with the goal and the focus on unfading crowns so that one day, Lord, we'd be able to take those crowns and lay them at your feet. We'd be able to worship you. Lord, may that be the kind of people that we are at Brainerd Baptist Church. We would be that kind of church family. It's in your name that we pray.